What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about a topic that was brought up by someone who is a green belt and thought that it was very important to know these two little letters, three little letters, two little letters, five letters all together, CP and CPK. And I've been thinking about doing this video for a while because these, these are very important letters to know and it's because it's driven by some very important metrics that we need to know. Those metrics are summed up by a process. So by the end of the video, you'll know the definition of CP and CPK. You'll understand the differ differences between CP and CPK. You'll know how to use CP and CPK, what we use it for generally. And then if you'll stick around to the end of the video, I'm gonna share with you a little trick that's not known by many, but some folks do know this trick. Um, but it's a quick way to recognize if you have a good or bad CPK just by looking at the histogram of the data or the distribution of the data. Now, when we're talking about CP and CPK, let's just get some things out of the way first. We're referring to process capability because these, I mean, the term CPK or CP stands for the capability of a process or process indices. So let's take, for example, I have uh, my iPad uh, plug thing here, this little brick. And let's say, for example, we were measuring the output of the process, which would be this brick. So we're measuring each one of these, and fundamentally, there's always inherent variation in any process. So you would measure these, and you would expect some sort of inherent variation, meaning that they're not always going to be, let's say, for example, if this was uh, roughly two inches for the sake of simplicity, let's say this was two inches, and as an output, you wanted all of these to measure two inches. Uh, well, we know it's not always going to measure two inches. So two inches would be maybe what the customer was requiring. They always give you this little thing called a tolerance. So we would, or a specification, if you will. So we would say, well, we want two inches. That's optimal. That's what we really want. But we know we're going to have a plus or minus, whatever that specification may be. You're going to see these words pop up as we talk about CP and CPK today. So I want to make sure you understand this. So CP, CPK, a measure of process capability. And the output of that process would be a widget of, or something, right? Whatever it is we're measuring, it would be an output of that process. Now, why is CPK so important? It's because it measures the dispersion of the data or the voice of the process as it relates to customer specifications or voice of the customer. So you have the voice of the process, the output two inches, right? That's the voice of the process. That's what it's telling you it's doing um, with some sort of dispersion and orbit variation in there. And then you have the and you have that related to the voice of the customer, which is the specification limits, right? It's the, and here's what we want, the nominal value, what we want to have with some sort of specification limits or tolerances. And that's why it's so important. It measures the voice of the process in relation to the voice of the customer. Now, this might be a good time to talk about two videos that I've done before. I'll put a link in the description below. You can watch them after this video and come back and watch this video if it's not making sense. But it, uh, one video goes over histograms and talks about how, uh, how to create a histogram from scratch. And so that'll give you some understanding of how um, these bell curves are created that we'll be talking about in this video. And the other video is how to calculate six sigma. So it's how to calculate six sigma from the ground up. And that also will be very useful. If you haven't watched that video, it'll help with this video. Um, but I would encourage you to go ahead and watch the rest of this video, go back and watch those, and then come back and watch this. It might make more sense. I'll put a link to those two videos in the description below. So now we talked about CP and CPK being capability indices. So let's define that really quickly. It's the capability indices is to quantify the capability of a process or characteristics to meet its specifications. So that's a standard definition. Now let's take a quick peek at how the formula looks. So you can see that CP equals upper specification limit, that's what the USL means, minus the lower specification limit, divided by Six Sigma. You see why I mentioned watching my Six Sigma video might help with this? So we'll get into that a little later in the video, but for right now, just know this is the formula. Now let's not talk about CPK right now, let's stick with CP. So if we have a CP value of one, that is a calculated value of a one CP, that means that we are basically the output of our process is right on the edges of the customer specification limits or meets the customer specification limits. When I say meets, it means that the data, the histogram, the output of that data rides right on those lower and upper specification limits, which basically means the voice of the customer or the voice of the process is meeting the voice of the customer. Now, if we have a CP greater than one, right? We have a CP bigger than one, 1 1.33. You see that a lot. If we have a CP of 1.33 or 1.1, and that means the voice of the process is inside, inside the customer specification limits. And that means that we'll see the customer, we'll see some space or some gap or some free room, if you will, between 
the specification limits and the edges of our bell curve. And this is a good thing. Now, conversely, if we have a CP that is less than one, that means that our process dispersion or variation is outside the customer specification limits. And this is a bad thing. Now let's use this brick again as an example. Let's say we talked about it before. We said we want two inches, right? We expect this iPad brick to be two inches. All right, well, you know we're gonna have some inherent variation. We don't want that variation to be a lot though. We love to see two inches, two inches, two inches, maybe 2.01, 2.02, 2.01, 1.995. .1 We'd love to see that, right? That means you have a really tight process. And if you were to take those measurements and put those into a histogram, that's why I mentioned the histogram video would be a great video to watch after this video and come back and watch this one. Then what you'll see is, is that when you bucket those together, you'll start to see this bell curve, right? And you'd see a really thin bell curve because the variation is so small or the measurements that we're taking of our output, the output of our process, i.e. this brick would be very small. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be much variation or dispersion in the data. Now, conversely, if we did the same thing and we were getting a lot of variation in these bricks, then we would see um, a lot of uh, dispersion or variation in our process data, meaning that uh, the voice of the process is not capable of meeting the voice of the customer, and you'd have a lower than one CP. Now, Apple doesn't have this problem, right? Because Apple makes really tight tolerances on their products. Another great example would be Legos. If you've ever taken Legos and snapped those together, those things are too, uh, it's incredible how, how tight those Legos are. In fact, they give you a little um, tool to wedge them apart. Very tight tolerances. If you buy off-brand Legos, or I don't, they, would, they wouldn't be called Legos, they'd be called something else, but if you buy off-brand, then you'll notice they're not quite as tight. And it's because they don't have the capability to meet those tight specification limits that Lego sets for themselves. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well that's CP, right? That's just CP. What about CPK? And why do we look at CPK? Well, CP is great if you're just looking at dispersion or how wide the process is measuring versus how tight the process is measuring in relation to these customer specifications. Yes, it's great, but there's a problem and it can be deceptive. Let's talk about that for a moment. Let's look at two distribution curves on the screen here. These two distributions of data have exactly the same width or they have exactly the same spread of data. Okay, now let's add in our specification limits, both our lower specification limit and our upper specification limit. Now, what if we shifted one of these distributions slightly? Now we haven't changed the dispersion, it's all the same, which means the CP fundamentally hasn't changed, but we've changed something, we've shifted the entire data set over. And you can see we're gonna be, we're gonna be producing more defects unless we do something. Well, this shift in the data is represented by K and it's added to the CP. So now what we have is with CPK, we have the dispersion of the data, CP. We also have if, it's, if the data is centered within the specification limits, the customer specification limits, which is the K, CPK. So now we have dispersion and if it's centered. So now we can see both of these really important qualities within a data set. One of those being dispersion of the data. The other one is how centered my data set is, that same data set is in, rel in relation to the customer specifications. So now you know what that K stands for. It stands for central tendency, the central tendency of that data set. Now let's take a quick look at the formula for CPK. CPK equals the minimum of the CP upper and the CP lower. That is, we take the minimum of the upper specification limit minus the uh, mean and we divide that by three standard deviations. And then we also take the mean minus the lower specification limit and we divide that by three sigma. And so wh whatever the result is of those two calculations, we take the minimum of the lower of those and that will be your CPK. Now you might be asking yourself, Chad, why do we take the lowest of those two numbers? And that's because the lowest uh, number is gonna represent the one that is the closest to whichever specific specification limit it is. So one's measuring the upper, one's measuring the lower, and so based off those results, you're gonna be, you're gonna be able to see which one is closest to that specification limit, and that's the one we wanna take because we wanna know how close we are to that actual limit, which is our voice of our customer. We don't wanna mess that up. So that's why we take the lower. Now, just for simplicity, if the data set is centered between the specification limits, perfectly centered, you're gonna get a CPK equal to the CP. So as you move through your career, you're gonna hear CPK used a lot. Do we have a CPK of 1.33, of two, 
And so the reason you're going to have that is because CPK measures the width of the specification with the width of the process while also measuring the central tendency of the data. And that's why we use CPK so often. So by now you should have a good fundamental understanding of what CP and CPK actually means. But let's talk about a little bonus here of how you can recognize if you have a good CP or CPK. CPK is what we really want to know. Uh, how, we, how we'll be able to recognize that if someone says, hey, we have a CPK of 1.33 or 1.67 or 2. Um, so I want, you to be able to, I want you to be able to visually see this, okay? So let's say, for example, I come to you and you have a CPK of 1. Now, based off the conversation we've had in this video, you should know that a CPK of 1 means that the data set or the dispersion of the data is going to be equal to or centered between both uh, the upper and lower specification limits. It, you will produce some defects here, but visually you'll know that you're riding right on the edge of the specification limits, but you're centered inside the specification limits. That's a CPK of one. Well, let's double that and say, what if you have a CPK of two? Well, if you have a CPK of two, the higher the better, that means that fundamentally your specification limits are here on the outsides and you can fit two of your histogram, full histogram curves or dispersions within the specification limits. So you have all that room to move around in. So that basically means that your process is running so well and your data is so tight, right? Very little variation. And you're also pretty centered that you have enough room to kind of float. That, that entire dispersion can float left or right up to two of those process dispersion widths. You have that much room. A lot of people use um, like a garage and a motorcycle, if you will, uh, for, for illustrations. They'll say, they'll say that when you have a CPK of one, that you're trying to pull a huge truck into a tight garage and you have very little room and every once in a while you're going to hit the mirror on the side of the garage. All right, but when you have a CPK of two, it's like the same width of specification limits, right? The same wide specification limits. But because the motorcycle is so small, you can come in and not really worry about hitting the garage. You can kind of move around and still get in the garage without damaging either the garage or the motorcycle, meaning that the process data is so tight, there's little dispersion, that you have enough room to move around and play around in without actually causing any defects. If you have like a 1.33 CPK, that means that you can fit one and a third curves within the specification limits. If you have a 1.67, that means you can fit one and two thirds of those uh, of the process data output within those specification limits. So by now I hope you have a clear, clear fundamental understanding of what CP and CPK is and you also have a bonus tip there on how to see it if you, um, you know, once somebody comes to you and says, hey, we have a CPK of 1.33, you know that that's pretty good, right? 1.67, awesome, and two is crazy good. So hopefully that helps you out. Listen, if you like this video, make sure to give me a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of content. Also, go down below and I'll give you something for free. If you'll sign up to my newsletter, it's a Kaizen overview. The skills are the top things you'll need for a good Kaizen event. Anyway, I want to make sure that you grab that as a free download, but more importantly, I want to make sure you get on that newsletter because if you want tips and tricks uh, or early releases on videos like this, then make sure you jump on that newsletter. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you all in the next one.